so happy to have with us tonight Maximus Thaler and Rachel Kadish, who founded Gleaner's Kitchen, a freegan organization in Somerville. Um, I'm going to ask them a couple questions just about their experiences, and then I'd love to open it up for questions from you guys. Hi, guys. Hi. Um, so I guess the first question I'd, I'd like to ask is, um, a lot of people leave this play and come up to me and they say, so events are an event to free games. Um, are free games real? Yes. Yes. How many of you had heard of free games before you came to the show tonight? Awesome. That's a much higher turnout than we had a couple weeks ago, so maybe the word is spreading. Um, I would love to just hear you guys kind of talk about how you found out about free games and maybe what your experience with it has been like. You found out first. Uh, well, we. Mic, please. Oh, microphone. Hi. Hello. Uh, we were living in a, in a cooperative house uh, where food was shared, and that was really sort of the, the core of it. Was that when there were thirteen people, maybe twenty people, um, and we all shared one kitchen, and so it, it just made made going out looking for food just made a lot more sense. Um, and it was. Uh, <laughs> Okay. Um, yeah, so the, the co-op uh, is called the Crass House. It's on the Tufts campus. Uh, we're both Tufts students. Um, yeah, so I first learned about dumpster, dumpster diving. Freeganism is more of a broader um, lifestyle, as Rory says, that isn't just about dumpster diving, but dumpster diving is the most sort of iconic activity within freeganism. Um, but I first learned about dumpster diving at the Crass House. Because um, like Max said, when you're a community of 20 plus people all sharing one kitchen, um, it makes a lot of sense economically um, and otherwise to just find food and share it freely with people. So that's how we learned about it. Co-ops and free use and build our world together. <laughs> and I'd love to hear you guys talk a little bit about what Gleaner's Kitchen, the organization you founded, was about and sort of what your methods were. Yeah. Um, well, I guess to, to continue that narrative, um, when I started dumpstering, it was it was much more just sort of like a leisurely activity. You know, we were you know, a bunch of college students, and we had weekends, and so we would go out at night and get a bunch of bread. It was just sort of a fun thing to do. Um, but as I as I had started doing it more and more, it it just sort of like there, there's a point where you start looking at things in the dumpster, and you you can't not have your perceptions of value shaken. Like it's just, there's so much in there, and it's it's by all this metal, but it's it's there, and and it just it, it was it was a, a kind of existential crisis, absolutely. I mean, the, 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 the neurosis in the play is a little extreme, but it's definitely like I I lost track of, of how to quantify the value of something, and what felt value to me was was these sort of like more tangible experiences of, of, of getting food and sharing with people that I loved, um, and I wanted to continue that after I graduated, and so that was that was sort of the impetus for the Try to create a space where where new ideas about value can be explored, or, or potentially very old ideas about value can be explored. And you're talking about finding food, right? Not somewhere far away, but in dumpsters around Cambridge and Somerville, right? Yeah. Where were you guys finding food, and what, and what was in there? Well, that was in there. Yeah, that's what those pictures. Are. So all this food behind us. That right? was from a single night, yeah. and that's not even the whole frame. And where was that from? That was from Trader Joe's. Some of it got turned into that. Um, yeah, there are, I would say, three or four. Sorry. I would say there are at least three or four places um, that I can count on going to and finding an absurd amount of something. Whether it's like $300 of seafood or three dozen tomatoes or five crates of bananas. Um, one time we did find five crates of bananas and a bunch of us that lived in the co-op just dressed up in crazy costumes and came out to Harvard Square and ended up bananas. And people were like, what is going on? So um, I guess, like, like, the hardest thing to wrap my head around is, is, is this a, an occasional thing? Like, once in a while, grocery stores throw away this stuff and you have to be kind of lucky to find it? Every day. Every, every day. Every single every day. day. The, the, statistic, the statistic that, um, this is an old statistic now, it's from 2004, I think is the paper I found. Uh, the estimate is that the average U.S. grocery store throws about $2,000 worth of food every night away. And how many grocery stores are, are just in Cambridge? There's five or six, so you're talking $10,000 worth of food a night in, in a square mile. Um, so it's, it's, it's really, really absurd. So when you were finding this much food, like, what is your thought process? Why is it garbage? She's a in the play. What, what makes this food? You have you who've gone through the dumpster and seen it. What, 
what can you tell about why this food is garbage and why it isn't in the store? Um, to distill it in a sentence, and I'm very proud of the sentence, is, is um, <laughs> basically the, the thing that a grocery store does, because it's a store, is they sell you food, but because it's in the marketplace, they're, they're actually in the business of selling you the idea of food, which is not necessarily a bad thing, but it's just, it's all about packaging and branding and, and all of, because they're, they're competing against other brands, so they have to sell an image. And so what the, the content inside the package just sort of gets lost, because that's not going to sell, what's going to sell is what it's like. So what were you guys trying to do with Glare's Kitchen? How did that group work, and what happened with that group? Uh, well, my brain still sort of on the last question. Um, just to throw in a little bit more about aesthetics, um, grocery stores and other food distribution centers, they're all about aesthetics, but food isn't really about aesthetics. So when you get to a point where something is no longer aesthetically pleasing and nobody's going to buy it, then that's when it becomes considered garbage or considered waste because it doesn't look pretty. But food isn't really about looking pretty, it's about feeding us. And oftentimes, Things that don't look pretty are actually the tastiest and can, can really do, do a lot to feed us all in the building community. Um, can you say that question one more time? Yeah, so, so talk us through what you guys did at Williams Kitchen, what that group sort of did, and what happened with that group. Um, well, it's been a lot of different things. Um, it's always been in limbo um, since it began. Um, towards the end of the play, when Smith is talking about how she has a position and she has a desk and she has a window, um, and she's talking about all of that, there is a lot of truth to that, that you do need to have a position and a place in order to be able to, to have a home base, um, to be able to do what you're setting out to do and to be able to affect change. Um, and that's one thing that the Glitter's Kitchen has never quite had. Um, as you can imagine, landlords aren't exactly thrilled with the idea of creating a space where people of all walks of life come in and eat food that came out of the garbage and play music and make art. And, you know, landlords aren't really about that. And that um, was the original idea, right? Yeah. Like a kind of free restaurant. Should yeah. I sort of brief history yeah. of that? Okay. So, um, we, we were, this was in the spring of 2013, so about a year and a half ago. Uh, we were preparing to leave the co-op that we were living in and, and attempting to, to sort of create a sort of similar environment still in Somerville. Uh, so we rented a house uh, in, on Powder House Circle and I, I made a video, you know, sort of very similar to, to the video that opened the, opened the play, um, showing, showing dumpster diving and, and the like. And the idea was that we were going to create a free restaurant. Um, and it's going to be in our home because because that that separation between uh, public and private was, was something that we were trying to, to play with. Uh, so the idea was to, to start a free restaurant in our home, in our in our basement, an underground restaurant, so to speak, uh, that would be completely free um, and, and open to the public. And we got a surprising amount of notoriety for it. Like it, it sort of it, it took us really by surprise. And they're, they're all you know the same thing as these, these dresses and all these media companies want to. I'll look at these weirdos in the trash, and um, it, so it, and the, the cool thing was that you know there, there there was a lot of press. I got to write a book. Um, I, I should have brought. I have a book that I wrote about dumpster diving. Um, but the the sort of the, the the bad part about that was is it made us very Googleable, and uh, I wasn't really paying that much attention to real estate law because I you know wasn't really paying that much attention to, to property in general because it, the whole concept was just bewildering me. Um, so I just sort of rented the space and figured that if, if we were paying for it, then it would be our space. Uh, but that was not quite the case. <laughs> um, and our landlord was not, not keen on what we were trying to do, so we were evicted. Um, but the ideas are all still there, and, and there's that, you know, that's always been, been the same. Like, it's, it's very material, but it's also um, very ethereal. And, and catching that balance between the tensions of the play are, they, they are quite resonant with me. And you guys have evolved kind of into a more mobile operating status, right? You just catered to Hong Festival, is that right? Yeah. Right what right. type of food did you bring to Hong Festival? Yeah. Um, what did we bring to Hong Festival? That was not 100% dumpster um, food. 
most of it, most of it was. We fed 400 people for well under a dollar a person. Um, and it was right just before Halloween. Um, so I hoped when I went to the dumpster I'd find pumpkins, and lo and behold, I found like 15 pumpkins, and we made a pumpkin stew. Um, we got a bunch of hot water juice. We could have gotten way more than we did. It was just, and where was all this? Um, just in various dumpsters around the Boston area. Um, we got some things donated. Um, in general, it's difficult as an individual without any kind of institutional backing to go to a grocery store or a place that sells food and ask them for their excess. Um, there's a lot of nervousness about liability and things like that. Um, we've been told, give us your 501c3 form and we'll get back to you, but we don't have a 501c3 form, so. Well, I'd love to open it up to questions from the audience. Um, does anyone have a question for Max, Ms. and Rachel? Go here first, and we'll come back there. Do you have a relationship with food like bombs? Yeah. Because um, I remember them from the early 90s, like 80s. They've been around for a long time. Bagel bands, bagel stove, mics. And yeah, uh, I mean, I, I think I've spent a little more time with Food Not Bombs than Rachel. Um, I, I, I learned to cook, basically, from, from Food Not Bombs cook um, at, at the Brendan Health Theater. Um, and I've, I've cooked for a number of Food Not Bombs chapters. I was just out in, in California cooking out there. Um, Food Not Bombs is a fantastic organization. Uh, what we were trying to do was slightly different, because Food Not Bombs sort of is, is directly catered towards the homeless population, which is absolutely fantastic. Uh, but what we were trying to do was, was really see if we could create create like a, a physical community and a physical structure around around all of this <coughs> free food. <coughs> Great, I see a question back here. You know, where does this, the cleaning fit in um, as opposed to like, I know that have, some of the supermarket families have outdated crowded sections. Some people do take a bite. Um, or the various food banks that pick up stuff from supermarkets as well. The, does legislation fit in with this, expiration dates and all that? As to what, what has to be done with this? Uh, to clarify the question? <laughs> what is, where are the boundaries or what, 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 how do you differentiate from the outdated food section, because supermarkets do have that, or the deals that supermarkets make with various nonprofits to you know, give food banks food? Um, there must be some other part that neither of these groups takes you take. Oh, um, okay. And also, is there legislation that requires supermarkets to dispose of things at a certain time, for example? Um, don't quote me 100% on the legalities of expiration dates, um, but expiration dates aren't actually about food safety. They're about giving us a sense of security that something we're eating is safe for us to eat. Or by contrast, once the expiration date passes, it's telling us, no, don't eat that, it's not safe, it says October 30th. Um, there's no legal mandate, correct? Yeah, there's no actual legal mandate, and the expiration dates are very conservative because, again, people are afraid of liability. Um, and, and the other thing is that grocery stores are in competition for each other. They want to say that they've got the freshest food, so you see that there, there's a, you know, sort of a, a, a progression of expiration dates getting earlier and earlier. Um, and, and it's just, it's always been strange to me that people pay so much attention to expiration dates because they're, the, the food is right inside and you can look at it and you can like smell it and taste it and be like, oh, this is good, this is bad. Um, the symbols don't really mean much. And I, I think it helps. I know with milk, I know that I can last, I expiration dates, I can last about 12 days and then I smell it. So I know mm -hmm. that I'm going to get the milk from the back where the expiration is much more, much, you know, uh, have much more to go. And I think people are interested in the, in the expiration dates. The National Resources Defense Council in 2013 published a report saying that on average the expiration date is like two weeks before the food actually goes bad. Um, I saw a question over here too. I um, just wanted to say that Max and Rachel, since you couldn't necessarily go on having a, a free restaurant, um, my guess is you sought out opportunities to cook for big groups. In fact, I know personally that you, Rachel, and others cook for the, uh, say it, I can't say it, the Justice in Palestine Conference, remember? No, yes, I don't even that. 
And, and uh, so it, it seems to me that you consciously seek out, as cleaners, if you don't have a place, you seek out opportunities to cook for people. Is that right? Yes, absolutely. Um, because we don't have a physical space that we can that we can bring people to, we go to those people. So, be it the Hunk Festival, or be it um, Students for Justice in Palestine Conference, or we had some friends who started a climate justice organization a couple summers ago, the same summer that we were evicted, and so we catered for them a few times. Um, just finding people in the community who can support us doing what we do, and then we can feed them so they can keep doing what they do. This is really what it's become. And I have to let us, oh, have your question. Yep. Hi. Um, I'm wondering, uh, you did, somebody mentioned Food Not Bombs, which is an organization that helps um, homeless and, and people who have not means to get food, right? Mm -hmm. And then you folks are um, going and finding food that other people have said this isn't worth it for people to eat, right? I'm wondering what, why can't those, that food that the supermarkets and whatever, whoever's getting rid of that food, are there regulations that say we can't give that food to homeless organizations? There are people hungry out there, why can't we give that food to people who are hungry? It's, why does there have to be the garbage? It's much less about regulation than you might think. There's actually, there's a lot of laws that make it quite easy to give away food. It's, it's really it's a distribution problem, and that's why so much food ends up in the, in the garbage to begin with. Is, um, so like the, the, the best example is, is you've got a dozen eggs with one egg cracked, right? So there's, there's egg yolk all over the carton, you've got 11 good eggs in it, but if you want to sell that carton, you're going to have to take those 11 good eggs out, replace the carton with a clean one, and, and, and put it back on the shelf. So it's just a lot of time and effort to, to make the food presentable. Um, and that, that sort of problem is present on all levels of the scale. So, so let's say you want to donate a bunch of food, well now you have to pay a truck driver to drive a truck across the city to get it to where it needs to go, and then somebody has to stock it. It's just the, the, the physical act of moving this matter around, especially perishable matter, is very, very tricky. And so it's just it's cheaper for these grocery stores when they're working on such massive scales to, to throw the food away. And so at, we, as two people who are you know, trying to feed ourselves and, and, our, you know, and our community, it's easy for us to rent a car and, and go at midnight and, and get a thousand dollars worth of food, but it's not really cost effective for the grocery store to do it, so they don't. And even if they were trying to donate it, they would end up losing money transporting it, so they don't. And I have to let them set the tree back up for the performance tomorrow afternoon, but just to wrap things up, what do you what do you recommend that people do with this information that there's all this edible food sitting in dumpsters all over Cambridge and Somerville? I, I've been working on this place for a couple weeks and I still have trouble grappling with that idea. What should people do, in, in your view? Do you think they should legislate or go up there themselves? Like, what, what do we do about this food that's sitting everywhere? Um, I think that the root of the matter comes down to the fact that people don't know what good food is, and that's obviously a gross generalization. But for me, the, the dumpster is this very poetic thing, where it, it tells us that food comes out of dirt, and it comes out of death and decay, and, and having an understanding of, of that, that's what food is. This is this is the source of it. And before it was this, it used to be you know a field. It still is a field. But that recognizing that, that food is, is this, this cyclical thing and having that understanding is just it's so, so important. And you know it's not that everybody has to go out and dumpster dive and, and it, it, but but recognizing that food is, is this real thing that like is is inexorably linked to death and and that the difference between Garbage and, and value is, is not as clear cut, and they they they, they create each other, and um, I think it's really important. And you talk about that a little bit in your book, right? You're cooking everything, right? Yeah. Well, I'm so happy that you guys all stayed. I think this is a really important conversation. Can I throw it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so I think raising that sort of consciousness and awareness is really important, and that's one of the main functions of the Cleaners Kitchen. Um, but it's not enough because grocery stores still exist as they do. You know, Romy talks a lot about capitalism and that's that's one of the main things at the root of it, is that the, it's not about food, it's about selling a product and making a product sellable. It doesn't matter what the product is. In this case, it just happens to be food. It just has to look nice. It just has to look nice and people have to spend their money on it. It's not, it's not actually really about 
feeding people. It's about making money more than it is about feeding people. Um, and that's quite distressing. Um, and figuring out what we can do. Um, one thing that's heartening is there's a grocery store chain in France that has started to purchase the ugly produce from the farms. One of the major sources of food waste is not actually from grocery stores, but it's from the very place that this food is grown. Bed cucumbers don't fit in boxes well, so they don't Right. Fit. Bed cucumbers don't fit in boxes, carrots with multiple roots as opposed to one big root. Um, it's still a carrot, it's still a cucumber, it's still delicious and nourishing and can feed people, and there's no use in it rotting in a field. Um, so they started buying that up from the farms and selling it at 30% discounted rate and turning it into soups and juices and things like that, and they've had a tremendous amount of success. Um, so I think institutions with power like that can make a decision that really has a big impact. Um, I think we can have an impact on raising awareness, um, but ultimately I want to live in a world where I can't do this because there's nothing to find, because it's all going to people. Well, I think you guys set a really thought-provoking example and I'm really proud of you guys. So thank you so much for staying and thank you very much.